Okay, hi, Year 12s. Uh, this is a section on page 62 to page 79 of Ransom. And in it, we learn of Priam or um, Podakis' backstory, his childhood trauma that is indirectly referred to earlier on in the novel. And now um, Priam retells this to his wife, Hecuba, as a strategy to attempt to gain her permission or approval with his plan to go and ransom his son's body back. So uh, it's all part of his appeal to her is the dramatic retelling. So it is a form of flashback. Remember that the literary definition of flashback, <clears throat> sorry, the literary term or the meta language for um, flashback is analepsis. Okay, so we have analepsis and prolepsis. Um, prolepsis being a flash forward, analepsis being a flash back, um, but it is t in a retelling. So it's not a flashback in the sense that um, Priam uh, remembers it and goes to it in his mind, like the flashbacks of Achilles uh, in part one, but this part two is um, a retelling or an analepsis through, a, through dialogue, retelling, um, and the audience is Hecuba. Okay, um, so we're going to start. So he introduced that he's about to tell his story, and we're going to start on page 64. Okay, um, so we get the sense from 64 that there has been some sort of terrifying uh, event that Priam has encountered. Um, this middle of his story, the beginning of his story, he was young prince of. Troy, son of Laomedon, the king of Troy, and the end of his story we know is he is king of Troy, but in the middle there is a terrifying business, okay? And this is kind of the whole story retold here. He has a turnabout and an in a miracle, the victim is snatched up and restored. So that's the whole story summary in one sentence. But um, the retelling of it starts now and it goes for literally about 15 pages until 79. <clears throat> so begins by um, a terrifying event that happens and he stood at the centre of this terrifying event. We know there was noise and smoke and panicky confusion. There was a horde of wailing infants, three or four years old, and these infants are described as, so they've been... Um, um, driven out of the castle, the blazing citadel, which is on fire. So the castle's on fire and they've been driven out and they are described as a rabble of filthy, lice-ridden brats with the mark of the whip across their shoulders, the mark of the whip um, indicating that they are the children of slaves, okay? And it says they are the spawn of beggars, peddlers, scullery maids, stable hands, stable hands and whores. So these are the ordinary kids or rather the lower status children of the castle, of the town, of Troy, of the palace. Um, spawn, which means children, also has a strongly negative connotation. We, you may have heard it, spawn of the devil. Um, so it means the child of, but it has a really highly negative feeling like an evil child sort of. So anyway, they're described as filthy. There's a lot of negative imagery or um, um, imagery that describes dirtiness. So I want you to look for um, adjectives referring to dirty, um, some sort of uh, like visual imagery that Maloof is using to describe the condition that Priam was in. So all these kids have been smuggled together and there was a few pampered lords like him, Priam, who were hiding in amongst the um, like the children of the slaves and the whores and everything else. And they are hiding now and here is another graphic description. So we've got um, imagery again used here. They're hiding, they're smeared with shit to disguise the sweet scent of herbs on their skin. So they're hiding the fact that they're clean because they know if it's known that the children of lords are hidden amongst there, they will be killed like their brothers who've had their throats slashed. Okay. Um, 
So we get the sense that there's been some sort of war, some sort of invasion of Troy, um, and the enemy have rounded up the young kids. So they huddle in groups. Um, they're half asleep. There's been a slaughter, and they haven't had a drop of water. The smallest are blubbering, crying for their mothers. They cling together. They're all grimed with ashes and streaked with the dried blood of whoever it was whose arms we were sna snatched from. So they're dirty. They've got filth. They've got shit. They've got dried blood. Um, they've got all kinds of things that are dirtying them. Notice the imagery there too. Okay. And there's a group of guards watching them. Um, and they are terrifying, especially to somebody like Priam, who's only ever known people who will fulfill his every need. Okay. And occasionally they toss handfuls of crusts into the crowd and they laugh. So they throw these bread crusts into the crowd of kids and the mob of hungry, half-naked urchins fall upon them and they start fighting each other, biting, gouging, howling. Note the ascendaton there. Remember, ascendaton is where we uh, list things without using the conjunction and. So uh, it creates a sense of the chaos. But when they actually start fighting each other and hurting each other, the masters, um, the guards, actually step in and break it up because these kids are properties of their masters. They're future slaves. Okay, 67. And Priam is one of these swivel snivelling barefoot brats. Okay. So he's six years old at this time and he hopes that he is indistinguishable for him because his survival depends on it from the offspring of the lowest scullion. That would be a good quote to learn. Instead of saying lower class, you might use offspring of the lowest scullion. Um, it's just a way of using a textual reference to uh, describe the type of people that were there. Um, so he makes himself small and notices that the people he is hiding amongst, so the kids that he's hiding amongst, are actually palace slaves. So any one of them could actually say, hey, that's the prince. Um, so they don't make eye contact. And he's describing that what this contrast is like to be in one moment the pampered darling. Okay, So at one moment he's like the um, privileged pampered prince. Um, and there's some detailed descriptions of his privileged life there. And then, um, so at one moment, he's Podarkas. Now, some people say Podarsis. It does not matter. Both pronunciations are acceptable in the Australian Style Guide of English. Podarkas, I think, is the way that it's pronounced in Greek. Um, according to a colleague of mine who happens to be a fluent speaker of Greek. Um, but Podarsis would be the accepted English pronunciation. I don't mind, you can say which, whichever. Actually, in your essays, you're going to be writing them, so it really doesn't matter. But I do want you to remember the spelling. The danger with saying Podarkis is you might write it with a K. But it's so um, for that reason, whatever helps you to learn the spelling of it. Okay, so but this is actually where we learn Priam's name for the first time, his original birth name. He was Podarchus, son of Laomedon, king of Troy. So at one moment he's that, and at the next moment he's just one of a rabble of slave children. Okay, and then he has this smell on him, and the smell is like there's repetition. Um, the smell on me, the smell of another order of being, a foul slave smell. Um, that really emphasizes the <clears throat> sensory imagery here, which is olfactory imagery. Olfactory means your nose. So it's, if you are analyzing this, you could talk about the use of Maloof uses olfactory imagery to emphasize the stench or the smell that is on Podarchus as a kid. Um, and that um, smell will be representative of his perceptions of himself. And, um, 
So this has always been secret. Now, up to here, you notice the quotation marks, that's indicating dialogue. That's the retelling of this analepsis, this um, flashback. But um, here, just for this little section, we move to present tense. Um, and he is feels that this is so shameful. It's been a secret in him. He's never told anybody else ever. And then he continues with his story. Um, and there is a description at the, the bottom of 68 and the top of 69 about a road, narrow, white, winding off across the plain, dwindling into a smoky haze. So there is this road, and that road leads to slavery. That's the road he, notice the use of italics there um, to emphasise the significance of the he. We don't know who he is at this point. It comes a bit later on. Um, but anyway, the way I see it is this. It's like a Y intersection, and there is two paths. And one is the road that you actually take, and this is like the key moment, the defining moment. And if you took this other path, your whole life might be different. This road that's described is the road not taken. Um, lots of poems and things in history, even a whole uh, film, if you've ever seen Sliding Doors, is about the road not taken. Like what happens if this one key moment in your life, if you catch the train or don't catch a train, that was the premise of the whole film, um, Sliding Doors. Now, I don't know, I read this and I'm not sure whether it's actually a road that the slaves go down physically or it's a metaphorical road. In any case, Maloof doesn't really make it clear. You can decide yourself whether you think it's an actual road or a metaphorical road, but this road leads to slavery. The one that Priam went down, obviously his king, um, is a different road. But he talks about this road, this metaphor. This road, he can still see it. The road my other self went down. So not the road I went down, but the other self. To a life where you and I, my dear, remember that the audience is Hecuba, never met. So de going down the road I didn't take led me, would have led me to a life without you. In the same body, but a different life. And that life too I have lived if only in a ghostly way. So... Um, it's, it's like perhaps, and you can interpret this how you will, but I really think this means that in his mind he's actually lived this other life because he's thought throughout his whole life what would it be like if I had that life. So that I think is what it means in a ghostly way, like he's in his imagination. Yes, and then he still talks about this foul-smelling mockery of the life. Um, he says at the bottom of 69, that there are things, once we have touched them, we can never throw off. The stench is still there, the old filth sticks in our nostrils. And this makes me think of, um, so what this makes me think of, <laughs> okay, a few years ago, year 12 at our school, we studied Lady uh, Macbeth, and Lady Macbeth, there's this great scene at the end of Macbeth where she's washing her hands and... Um, trying to get rid of the blood stain because she was part of the murder plot. In fact, she initiated the murder plot to kill the king. Now, that, like the blood is never there on her hands, but no matter how much she washes her hands, she can't get rid of it. I feel like this is something like that. Like this stench, it's not a, a like a physical thing, it's a, it's a smell. This smell he can never get rid of. He can't wash off the smell of the child that he was, the young urchin. is. A good descriptive word that's used um, and he late at night or when he's in some sort of ceremony this smell will be all around me so he can smell that smell and he, maybe he wonders can anybody else smell it like it's so real to him like he's back there in a ghostly way yeah and I'm back there in the midst of it looking down that wide dust road into the other life yeah, and so it's the what if, and it answers that question that perhaps we all have: the what if this didn't happen? Um, and there's a, an imagery that's used, and this rep, um, phrase, "wine-soaked poppy cake," is used three times in this description on the next couple of pages to represent privilege 
and wealth. Okay, the fact that it's used a couple of times to me indicates that it could be something that we use in our essays as a representation of wealth, as opposed to later on you're going to get an imagery of another type of cake called griddle cakes, which are used by the ordinary man, Somax. Okay, um, okay page 71. So here, all of the other children as well have... Um, also resigned themselves, they've just given up, and I resign myself. He lets his old name go. So this is the point where he kills Podarchus in his mind and he is reborn as no one. And again, the repetition of this pop wine-soaked poppy cake. Um, and here he's reborn as no one. So I think at this point, the fact that it's capitalised, no one, to me indicates that he's like given himself a new name. Like I have no name. Remember the longest memory from last year. Okay. Um, so I have no name. I am no one. Okay. Um, so he names himself no one. Um, but only for a short time because he's about to give him a new name over the next page. But here, the moment of being saved, bottom of page 71. Podarchus and his sister, I do not know how to pronounce this name, Hesione, I don't know. Um, anyway, his sister comes um, and she is accompanied by this mysterious he, who we find out is Heracles, our father's enemy. So the father's enemy has got Hesione and they're down in the dungeon and Hesione is there. <clears throat> and Podarchus, no one at this point, is like, sure, don't, don't look at me, don't, you know, she, he knows he has to hide. Page 72. Okay, and there's a conversation between Hesione and um, Heracles, and he's like, what? You choose that thing? Why? Because he's my brother. And so we learn that 73 will come over. Okay, we learn here, okay, that the sister is just a child. She is going as a prize of war to Heracles' friend Telamon. And he said she can have as a gift whatever she chooses, anything her bright eyes light upon. And they think that she's going to choose a gaudy trinket, a bauble, like a piece of jewellery, a mirror, something to catch her smile in. They think she is, um, what's the word, superficial perhaps, but she is Laomedon's daughter. She instead, perhaps she knew that, um, that Podarchus was down there, Maybe she was part of the, hiding them there in the first place. Who knows? But she went straight down to the horde of filthy, tear-strained urchins and searched among them and chosen me, Podarchus. And Heracles says, well, I, mate, I promised you, take him. Take the brat. Let him be whatever you say he is. And because he is my gift to you, let his name from now on be Ransom be Priam, which means the price paid. Okay, and there is a symbolic connection. So you can use the word that his name symbolizes the key action of his life, so a defining moment of his life. But this can also be an example of eponymy, which is where uh, one's name is given. To, so this book, Ransom, is named based on Priam. So it's the, the ransom of Hector, but also um, the ransom of Priam. So symbolically, the name of the text is referred to here by the name of one of the protagonists, Priam. Okay? And basically, he says, each time he hears himself named Priam, he will remember that it's because of him, Heracles, because he allowed 
Hesione to choose him out of this filthy rabble, that he was a slave, a nameless thing. Okay. And Priam, the price paid, the substitute and pretender, the great one of the earth. This is a bit of a sarcastic tone used here, but only because I granted it. Therefore, I am all powerful and that I granted you this. Therefore, the name of Priam, every time he hears it, he will remember that he was that urchin child, that slave, that no one or no named thing. Okay. Heracles was half a god, it says. Um, so that's just an extra detail. I don't know that we need to know that, but um, okay. And now here, okay, then even though, whoa, it's Heracles who and Hesiono who's actually saved him, the top here really talks about the fact that um, or suggests that the gods had relented. So Priam recognises the hand of the gods in this action. Okay, so he didn't feel that he'd been delivered or saved because he was so close to just being sent off to a lifetime of slavery and he couldn't unexperience what he's experienced. For your breath to be in another's mouth, your life to be in another's hands. And after here, after playing with me a little, showing me what was in their power to do, the gods had relented. So again, this repetition of that somehow this was all in the hands of the gods, which is potentially uh, explaining why he doesn't trust the gods so much um, and his uh, belief in fate, destiny. Um, and again, he they would allow him to cough up this bit of wine-soaked poppy cake, but he'd gone too far. He couldn't actually get back to that wine-soaked poppy cake. He had gone too far. He had the smell on him, the smell now in his armpits, on his hands. Hecuba stops him and says, no, this is so ugly. Don't talk about this. He says, but they happen and they happen to me, not just to other people. She just doesn't know what to think. This, she's so frightened. Um, she has this moment imagining what had happened and this crowd of dirty wailing children and it's like she can't even imagine it her life is so privileged he shouldn't have asked it of her and then he returns the story that he was restored okay but it was in a ghostly way with a new name as a substitute so even though he was actually the boy he felt like a substitute which is the word that Heracles used uh, yeah, really? Is it really? It's just a substitute, right? Not really the prince. Okay. Except that I know him. I lived the first six years of his life. And I have made my way down into the underworld and sought him out, that small frightened child. He's still that small frightened child underneath. Okay. And there's the contrast here that as a king, I have to act in full assurance. Okay. Um, he acts in the realm of the seen, but he's so he's he has to be confident and bold, and, and he has to act confident of what the gods are doing. But he had that taken away, but it was given back, but in a left-handed way, suggesting oh, I wasn't really given back. But now, this is my affair. So now, okay. I've, I've always hidden this part of me. I've, I've always hidden the fact that there might be a lack in me. To the public view, I've always been like perfect, the discipline of kings. You'll see great connections in this section to the queen. Okay, I had to be a stickler for the rules, page 78. Okay, I had to, middle of 68, 78, sorry, create the proper illusion. Okay. I had to create the proper image, a dazzling eminence, never to wobble or look flustered, like putting on a mask, I think I said, a perfect mask. Um, and even in the later days of my old age, I can't even have my hands tremble. Yes, but I did this out of defiance of the gods as well in as fearful reverence. Okay. But I, their first choice was against me, 
So God's first choice was to attack me. And maybe they've chosen against me again, okay, that I have to ransom a second time to ransom myself as well as my son. And here, this is a really significant moment to go going to Achilles, not in a ceremonial way, as my symbolic self, the king self, but stripped of all glittering distractions and disguises as I am, that little urchin, that slave, Podarchus. And that's the end of the story. Hecuba is kind of resigned herself. She's silent. She doesn't really say anything, but then she says, let's not talk of this anymore. You go have a bath and I'll summon your sons and the wisest of the council. Let's say what they have to say. It's like she gives up. This story has given, has convinced her enough to allow it to move to the next stage. Let's let the Let's let your advisors and your sons have a say in it. And that's the end of this section. We'll go on to um, 80 to 90 in the next section, which is like a family meeting where the whole of the Trojan royal family decide what Priam is going to be allowed to do. And that's the end of today's lesson.